important for all antenna engineers to be familiar with the loop antenna because it's kind of a basic building block. And it also has a very similar uh, relationship to the half-wave dipole. In fact, electrically small dipoles shrink the half-wave dipole, make it small, and electrically small loops actually have very similar radiation patterns. The only difference is that the polarization changes. So I have basically two types of loops. Small loops, which happens when uh, my loop antenna, whatever shape it might be, as a perimeter is much less than a wavelength. And that's nice because that means that there is no actual phase change or standing wave that's observable around the loop wire. No actual standing wave. It all looks like it's the same amplitude and phase. Um, and then we have electrically large loops. where the perimeter is on the order of the wavelength. So let's just start with the uh, <clears throat> electrically small loops. So in this problem, let's talk about the small loop current distribution. I have a small loop. I'm going to slide off this could be either square or circular. I'm going to draw it on here like a square first because we're eventually going to enlarge this diagram. So that it becomes a perimeter of wavelength. But right now we're going to say that the side lengths here, this is going to be in the x, x direction, this is going to be in the y direction. Side length L. The vector magnetic potential for this radiating system given as follows, A, R, B, theta, equal to J, K, that's the wave number again, S, where S is the loop area. So if this is a square loop, it's L squared. That's what S is. If it's a circle loop, pi R squared. An ellipse, you probably got to use an elliptical to calculate the perimeter. Mu permeability of the surrounding medium times current I times EXP to the minus JKR, of course there has to be that time, sine theta, really just like an electrically short dipole, you're going to have a peak in this direction along X and Y when theta is equal to 90 degrees and a null in positive or negative Z when theta is equal to this is going to fall off 4 pi r over r, fall off in field. It's going to be polarized in that direction. Which means, if this is what the uh, vector magnetic potential is, then it's fairly straightforward to get the far field E and H expressions. You remember that from the first couple weeks of class. I don't expect anybody to remember that from heart. That's why it was on the formula sheet on the back of your test. 
this is going to be eta, the medium of free space, 377 ohms, if you're in free space. And each field looks strikingly similar. Case square. Final sign. The x speed of the minus jkr sine theta. This is in the theta hat direction. And also it falls off one over four times. And if we wanted to calculate the pointing vector, oh, it have to be an expensive pointing vector. That's going to be equal to A. I don't know how to do that, right? I'm not going to insult your intelligence by writing out cross E with H complex conjugate, take a one half because it's your time averaging. K to the fourth. S squared, current squared in amps, sine squared, r hat divided by 32 pi squared r squared. The power radiated in this system, if I integrate this expression over 4 pi steel radians, it's going to be equal to eta, k to the fourth. I squared over 12. If you know what the total radiating power is for a given current flowing around, oscillating, sloshing back and forth, I would feed it like this. I got in, drawn it here. I got a current coming in, current coming out. The radiation resistance. would be one half uh, I squared R rad would be equal to this power, which means the radiation resistance could be solved. And it's going to be about 31,200 S over lambda squared ohms. So, this is interesting. We see the exact same problem we had with electrically small dipoles arise with an electrically small loop. When the loop is small, we have a terrible radiation resistance problem. When S is really small, we already said that S has to be, the perimeter has to be small. So if the perimeter is small, S, which is the area around that, inside that perimeter is very small. If I divide that by a wavelength squared, and I take that and square it, even though I'm starting out with 31,000, I wind up getting just a couple of ohms of radiation. And we know in this class that if I'm trying to couple into a radiation resistance that's only a few ohms, well, it might as well be like coupling into a mega ohm resistor, the opposite side of the Smith chart. I can't match to just a couple ohms. If I try to match with a couple ohms, I'm going to use so many reactive components that... Uh, um, I will not be able to um, uh, losslessly do the match. I will burn up more power in the Q factor and the ohmic losses of my matching network than I actually deliver to this tiny resistance when S is really small. You can see, though, that it grows pretty quickly. If you can get even a, you know, partly the way to lambda squared, start to get a pretty decent resistance. There's also a trick that you can use with loop antennas that you do not have available in the dipole, at least not directly available. In a way you do if you start doing folds of a dipole. I showed you a folded dipole, right? Where you short the bar and that actually quadrupled the impedance of the antenna. I can actually add extra shorting bars, and weirdly enough, that actually 
it increases the impedance of the antenna. It still maintains the half wave dipole characteristic. The corresponding trick with the loop antenna is to make a coil go around and around and around several times. If I have n turns, where n is the number of turns, then my effective area is nls. And that boosts radiation impedance of the system. Any questions so far? Oh, uh, yeah. Turns the number of turns. Oh, that's a good question. Um, so, there's, there's a, a little bit of a trade off here. Because if you are increasing the number of turns, n is inside this squared term, right? To resist, your radiation resistance increases, right? That makes it much easier. And it increases fast. However, what am I also adding to the system as I increase the number of turns? What would you say? Yeah, more starts with I. There you go. That's right. I got a coil. This is going to be a bad inductor, right? That means I'm going to have to tune that inductance out. Best to do that with a uh, capacitor. I will potentially to get the system to truly resonate cancel all the reactive components of it. Do maximum power transfer from a real value transmission line into a source. Then I am uh, I'm going to have to uh, add some extra reactive component. Now, I have a little example antenna here. I won't pass it around, uh, but I'll leave it up on the table here. When I pack up, I'll show it to you here at home or to on the camera. camera. It's a loop antenna. It was designed by a GTR engineer, a GTRI engineer named uh, Roger Haas. He has this really neat way of making loop antennas that are capacitively coupled. So this is a microwave loop. So the, the uh, radiation um, resistance is fairly high because the wavelength is small. But you still get inductance that you need to tune out, especially if you want to kind of shrink it up. Uh, the way he did is really beautiful, compact loop design. So in order to get the thing to resonate, like you're reading from the script, um, they use a capacitive break at various spots along this antenna. So if you look at it from this side, I don't know if you can see it. I'll show you at home. There's a metal path with a bunch of breaks in it. And of course, a feed line for one one of the feeds. And then on the other side of the printed circuit board, there's another feed line, and it has the complementary brake pattern. So what this really looks like electrically is a feed for loops. that has capacitive brakes built into the path to cancel some of those inductances that build up. So, while this isn't necessarily coiled and getting really big inductances, because it is electrically larger than a, a really, really small loop, uh, you built these in. And so you get a nice resonant antenna, probably at 50 ohms. I haven't put this exact specimen on the network analyzer because there's no But you see, it's got this same sine squared data pattern. We saw that with the ideal dipole and the Hertzian dipole. So in fact, uh, our directivity would be that same rehab sine squared when we normalize that, kind of like you did on your test. Hopefully that seems familiar. So this is a good place to leave off. Uh, when we come back on Monday, I'll talk about 
electrically larger loops. There are a different animal altogether. It's interesting. This small antenna, like a half wave dipole, just with the polarization changed. Or actually, it looks more like a short dipole with the polarization flipped on its end. When you go to a larger loop, you start getting much more interesting pattern. But a purely resonant one. This one, you'll always have some sort of inductance to resonate out of it if it's electrically small. You get to the resonant length of about a lambda, you shouldn't get any inductance or capacitance. And, uh, hook that straight into your, your uh, feed line and get pretty good coupling into it. Okay, thank you very much. We'll call it a day.